Longtime fans of the show should be familiar with the lender formerly known as Sue Pullen, and I'm pleased to announce that she's back, fresh off a rebrand and ready to help as Sue Mackey. Sue is a certified mortgage advisor at Fairway Independent Mortgage, an equal housing lender who focuses on finding the right product for you and your needs. She has over 20 years of experience helping thousands of homeowners. Whether it's purchasing, refinancing, or even a reverse mortgage, Sue will help. Sue's licensed in 36 states now, so reach out and let Sue Mackey it happen for you. The best way to reach her is just give her a call at 520-977-7904 or in an email, spullen at fairwaymc.com. Fairway Independent Mortgage has an MLS number of 2289. Sue Mackey has an MLS number of 206048. That email again, spullen at fairwaymc.com. And that phone number is 520-977-7904. Shoot Sue an email and let her know she needs to update that address. You are listening to an entertainment program put together by a company called Financial Ineptitude. Anything said on this show is not an endorsement or professional advice. Would you really want to tell a court of law you were suing us because you thought taking financial advice from two idiots on a podcast put out by Financial Ineptitude was a good idea? Really? Clown hats my face. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the China Shop. Today, we have a special roundtable square traders planned put together by the China Shop's head of quality control and shop favorite, Joel MC. Joel, who'd you line up for today's expert? Because I know it's not one of us. No, no. Today we have a special guest from Vanta Trading. Uh, Mr. I'm Banks not familiar with offered... Vanta. Or Vanta. <laughs> Can you tell me more about who's this Vanta? Vanta Trading is an outfit who has come together uh, with a few special guys. Um, they've put up a room and are sharing an incredible wealth of knowledge. Oh, I know two guys who do something similar to that, but they work for Vanta, I think. Yeah, it's very similar, Kyle. The only yeah, the only similar. difference, the only difference is the guys at Vanta are correct. Oh, <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough. So you got Miss Mister Bag, Mister Bags. How you doing? Good, not too bad. How about you guys? I'm well. Ah, doing all right. Doing all right. Nice uh, Monday Monday evening. Licking my wounds from this morning. Oh no, I hope it's not too oh. bad. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Um, okay. Actually, it was not too bad at all because I, I tried something a little different today. I wrote down my trades as a loss as I entered them, so that way I wouldn't feel the fear as much. And I think it actually helped a little bit. But so, today's not about me. Today is about Joel. <laughs> today is about all of us, Scott. Absolutely. So before we uh, kick off into today's discussion, let me just get through the rest of the little housekeeping here. Um, if anybody would like to reach out, suggest uh, guests, corrections, questions for future guests, or perhaps you want to do one of these yourself, uh, you can do that via email at two bowls at com, or you can join our free Discord server where Joel and a bunch of other amazing people share their struggles and lessons learned with people like me and other like-minded market aficionados. All those links are going to be in the episode description, so you can check them out at your own convenience. Joel, why don't you uh, tell us what we got planned for today? Sure. I'm going to kick it off with just uh, thank you to you for offering up these round tables i encourage everyone to take part in them for serious kyle will let you come on and make a podcast with any celebrity that you can dream up <laughs> that you can get <laughs> I mean, listen, you do have to do I, a little legwork but once you do that legwork if you can line up a guest honestly kyle will let you make a podcast and it is absolutely fantastic it will help you grow it'll help you learn and it's a ton of fun and it helps me because it's one less thing that i gotta try to figure out <laughs> So True. thank you, Joel. You're welcome. All right. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Banks, Banks, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming. Anytime. Uh, Anytime. So first, like we always do, uh, Kyle just talked to Baba recently, but do you have anything you want to tell us about what's going on in Vanta before we get started? Yeah, so uh, and this is kind of a this is kind of a new step for us. So we we had a town hall, uh, I guess last week, uh, which you know, our town halls are just kind of round tables exactly like this get everyone together you know you get you know flary you know uh you know kyle joel uh bob on a mic there's going to be some good stuff that comes from it so so this past week we kind of implemented a, a new process to you know what we had as as more of like a passive learning um and i would say this next step is kind of more hands-on so it gets us a little bit more of the data points um so it's it's an evaluate like a baseline evaluation um that we will hand out to every you know every trader uh, we'll do some one-on-one -on -one calls with them after the fact. 
and it just gives us a little bit more of the information from each individual trader, um, how we can curb our, you know, our education videos, trade reviews, et cetera, you know, you know, for that individual or the individuals, you know, kind of in that same category. Um, and I, and I think it's a really cool thing. I don't know if anyone else is doing this, but it's, it's definitely a little bit more hands-on, more, um, in depth than just, you know, getting on live mic, um, or, or, you know, or even like just the passive videos. Cause I would say the vast majority of the time, um, if you're learning at your own pace, it's, you know, it, it's a good thing, but if you have questions, unless you're not afraid to ask, I would say those typically go, you know, unanswered, mm-hmm. right. Which this should be a lot more hands on, um, you know, with follow-ups, uh, which, which we're still fine tuning the process. Uh, but I would say the follow-ups are probably going to happen within, you know, the first 30 days of the baseline evaluation. And then I would say probably quarterly or monthly or something along those lines. So, you know, it's it's still a work in progress on our side of it, but it's it's something that we've been wanting to do. And I think it's going to be a huge step forward for us. It's an incredible thing. How much are you charging for the evaluation? So that is free. You can't be giving this away to trial members too, right? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in in our mind, you know, the the free part of the trial, um, it it's you know, in the past, it's always just been like the live piece of it, uh, with the chat, you know, chat, but the educational videos have always been hidden. So this is kind of a you know a I guess an alpha leak from me and Baba, if you want to say that. But as you know, it it's basically you know reliant on the individual trader coming into the room. So if you come in on a free trial, you're able to do a one on one call, do the evaluation with us, you know, absolutely for free. That's wild. I filled out that evaluation and it is, it is incredible. Joel, I agree. I filled mine out uh, over the weekend and uh, I found a few holes that I hadn't even really put a whole lot of thought into. And when you're sitting there trying to answer the questions, you're like, hmm, maybe I should have uh, considered this a little bit more. Oh, absolutely. There's so much value in, even if you, even if you decided to fill it out and chose not to follow up with the phone call or chose not to stay with Vanta, just to fill that questionnaire out there's so much value in that yeah and so yeah if you can pile that on top of spending some time with these guys it, it's a whole new level of education because it's mm-hmm. directed right at us i'm looking forward to my call i can't wait for it <laughs> well you should be getting a little sneak peek of it here i was just gonna <laughs> say and with that maybe we should start <laughs> yeah there you go this is uh not intended to be that i'm not sure if you've even read it mr banks that's uh, we can make an episode here with it or without it. Yeah. So I, I've read a handful of them with, you know, that I've sent in, I haven't gone through the individual trades of those evaluations, but I'll probably do that. Uh, you know, I, I would say probably after we get off here or in the next day or two. Excellent. Awesome. Just, you know, whenever I got the free time to do it and then, yeah. And then, and then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to start scheduling these calls the later part of this week, um, you know, to, you know, get the ball rolling. And, you know, I, it, it would be a pleasure to have you guys go first, actually. Well, I've, uh, I've already volunteered to Baba to, to do mine live. Oh, really? So whenever you guys are ready to do that, we'll just schedule it. Yep. Absolutely. That's great. That is yeah. going to be a call like no other. <laughs> cool. So let's talk about me. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead, Joel. Um, so my questions are going to be kind of around specifically my scenario and how I trade and how I have to bring trading into my life because I can't let my life revolve around the trading. It's got to fit me. And so some of the things that I have to do are prep before work and then figure out a way that I can, without interrupting a work day, um, still have an opportunity at the market. Um, and so my first thing is, um, Whenever I'm setting up my morning routine, I kind of um, go through all of the stuff that makes my process mine, uh, which has taken a long time to come by, but I have finally got a base to it. And so when I'm trading, I do my process in the morning and then I'm executing from my phone. And I've just used Google like remote login and it brings up i have four monitors it brings up all four monitors i can see all of my charts i can move around i can click on the dom and it executes as quick as i need to go 
um, I'm not scalping. And so it's not like um, I'm not talking about one second, two second trades. Um, and so as far as Mr. Banks, what do you, I guess, first off, what do you think about that approach? And is it something that's attainable and sustainable? I mean, I am definitely growing and probably at a slower rate because of uh, a few of those technicalities. But what do you think? Is that a way to actually trade is to get your prep done and then do it remotely? Yeah. So, you know, to that point, I would say I'm, I'm in a similar process as you. So I do a lot of my trading where, you know, it'll be on, you know, one side of my screen, you know, at work or, you know, along those lines. Um, but I would say most of my decision making comes pre-market, at least, you know, bias or trend or direction, something along those lines to set up a plan. And then my, you know, my actual trading happens in my, you know, defined levels, kind of exactly what you were talking about. Right. Um, in the sense of it being attainable, you know, I think, and I've said, I've said this to Kyle before, you know, I think you could pretty much use any indicator, um, any sort of setup. If you do it the exact same way every single time, you will be profitable. I mean, unless it's just an absolutely ridiculous strategy or whatever, but as long as it has know, an but, edge. Yeah, I mean, like so, moon you know, phases. It, <laughs> well, I don't want to go down that way. <laughs> but, uh, but 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 for instance, like if if you if you think it has an edge and it it's shown you know through back testing through data that it has you know some sort of edge to that strategy, there's no reason why that would be an issue. And I, I could see where, you know, for some people that's probably not doable in the sense of they want to have a full monitor, they want to have their laptop open, they want to have X, Y, Z. But I know I know Baba does that where he trades from his phone, he's remoted in. Um, and there's certain times that he does it. I would say the vast majority he doesn't. Um, but like, you know, I, I trade with certain companies or certain, you know, brokers because it's online um, where mm -hmm. like, right. you know, I'm not on Sierra because I don't want to log into Sierra. Um, and it's just an issue of like, I, you know, I don't have the access through my computer to do that. So, you know, I, I do a lot of it through online, you know, so like trade of eight or, you know, something along those lines where it's an online platform where it fits my trading. Okay. So oh. it's not necessarily, you know, through, yeah. So like on like, you know, like apex, you can set up through trade of eight, Yep. Top yep. step, you can set up through trade of eight, um, et cetera. So it's all web based. So, and, and it's, it, and I do it that way because there's a lot of times where I'll enter into a trade where, you know, I'll, I'll get through, you know, one hour of my trade or two hour of my trade, whatever I'm, you know, taking off where, and I'll move my stop to break even or something along those lines. But I want to be able to just watch it where, you know, I could just log in through the internet on my phone and it's right there. So it's, it's, you know, it, it, it kind of, defies you as a trader of like what you, you know, what you need your trading to be like, you know, for instance, like we trade similar in the sense of, you know, we're kind of on the go right? where, you know, like I'll have customers come into my office or I'm on a call or something like that to where I don't want to be checking my phone, but it's there if need be. Absolutely. And so do you, when you're at work then, are you executing mostly from your phone, but you've done your free work at home before you go to work? Am I understanding so, that right? Yeah. So if, if, if I'm, if I'm executing, I'm probably still doing it through the computer just because that's what my comfort level is. Okay. Um, I would say executing it. I've done it from my phone. Um, don't ask Baba, but I've done it from my car, <laughs> you know, or you're, you know, you kind of remote in, but, but, but at the same time, like if you get in, if you get into a setup, I mean, it's there, you gotta, you gotta hit it. So Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to go through my phone and, you know, execute a trade. But at the same time, I feel more comfortable executing uh, with my normal setup on, you know, just on the computer and, and, and I'll monitor it from my phone. I don't have any issues with that. I follow. Yeah, that makes sense, actually, because um, I think most of the troubles I've ever had trading from my phone is because I'm used to trading on the desktop platform. And that's where the issues come in it's the differences between the two but yeah. if you're familiar with the phone then there's no reason why that should cause you any um i guess technical issues yeah i mean i i know i know a handful of guys that trade from their phones and they're very profitable with doing it so you know if you mm -hmm. if you ask certain traders to do it that way um i highly doubt they could do that just because their comfort <laughs> level isn't you know isn't with executing that way right and sometimes i even feel like when I have an opportunity to actually sit at the desk here, 
I'll be like, this almost feels unusual. But if I'm like scanning monitor to monitor on my phone, I know exactly how far to slide my finger so that it moves from my one minute chart to my DOM. And I can hit my time in yeah. sales without even looking at it, right? I find also, I look at way less stuff when it's a smaller mm. screen. I can have it so that it's just my one minute chart of my DOM. I've got on this other monitor, my balance areas are all laid out. I've got a five minute chart. I've got my daily four hour hourly chart, all of it's spread out and in front of me on my monitors. But I almost find like once those levels are defined, then I can just wait. And that level is going to be on my one minute chart because everything's on my one minute chart. And so Joe, can I ask you? Yeah, a question? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Ask away. Uh, you it doesn't sound like you have any issues trading remotely. I'm just curious why you brought this up as the one of the topics that you wanted to ask banks about. Like, is there something in particular about trading remotely that does bother you or that does give you issues? No, sometimes I feel like it's almost treated like a handicap. Interesting. And so I wondered if other people are doing it, like maybe I'm the only one doing it. And if I'm the only one doing it and that's something that's holding me back, mm -hmm. then maybe I need to look at a different way. But if other people are doing it and doing it successfully, then maybe it's not something I even need to consciously or subconsciously even worry about. You know what I mean? Do you prefer one or the other? There's one more comfortable than the other. I mean, you kind of alluded no. to the bone being a little bit more comfortable or a little bit more familiar. I like having everything in front of me, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I'm used to my phone, right? I've been doing it for three years, right? I'm pretty well used to it. And yep. so, yeah, I mean, so, you know, on that standpoint, I would say it's, it's definitely not a handicap if, if it's something that you're used to. Now, now, what I would say is if you normally trade from your computer and you're starting a new job and you can only trade from your phone, you've never done it, but that's not the case. You, you yeah. know, you, you have the comfort level there, um, right. you know, where I think a lot of people have issues is where, you know, if, if you trade from your cell phone or trade, you know, mobile or on the go or whatever, I would say that most people would over trade um, where, hmm. and I, I would see oh, that being yeah. an issue where. Yeah, where you have it, you have it right there where you're always wanting to look at the market or you're needing to be in a trade. But if you if you have your set and defined levels where you're not kind of going out of your trade plan, it kind of takes that out of the picture. I mean, you could say the same thing about someone sitting in front of their computer all day. Right. But, yeah. you know, while you're on the go, you're grabbing lunch or whatever. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll look at the market, but I know that if it's not in my defined area, I'm not going to be trading that. Where I feel like a lot of people who are handicapped, you know, by that is because they have all the information right there where they might go out of their trade process to get into something that they're not comfortable getting into. It's just to be into a trade. Yeah. Well, also if your if your time is limited, that's another reason why I could see that being a problem. Like if you only have 5 minutes to check it on your lunch break, then you're more likely probably to force a trade because you're trying to make yeah, the most absolutely. quote unquote of the time you have available. Yeah, and yeah. I have been through that. The mm -hmm. way I, the way I got around that is actually the next part, which is, um, I use alerts a ton. Mm -hmm. I have it set up both for motive and through Sierra. Um, and if anybody's curious how to set up Sierra to send you, uh, like SMS text messages, just let me know. I can walk you through it. You can do it without paying them huge prices. Nice. Uh, most carriers can set it up so that I set my levels in the morning. I set alerts. And then I get a text message, prices within 10 points of an area you want to watch. Now it's within five. And then I know it's time I can look at my phone. It might be 20 minutes after I get to work, or it might be an hour and a half later. Um, but I have... I want you to show me how to do this, Joel. <laughs> and it's awesome. Yeah, I, I would love that as well. I'll, um, I'll see if I can screenshot it or even make a video or something in a way that doesn't give away my information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what it does is it just sends me a text, you know, NQ has reached 15,454. And mm -hmm. I knew that 15,434 was a level that I wanted to trade. And so it's, that also helps me in a way that I can just focus on work. Oh, text. Nope. This is a market text. Now I can open my phone and I haven't spent an hour waiting for this trade staring, staring at the screen. Yeah. 
and I've gotten all of my work done. And now where you say you have like a five minute opportunity at lunch or whatever, you mm -hmm. can actually execute in a five to 10 minute time period, but it's actually a trade you wanted to take. Right. Right. And so I really, really like that about the alerts. Um, but then I also wonder too, if it doesn't have your focus, do you know what I mean? You're not hmm. tired from staring at it, but also I've been doing four other things and now I pick it up. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, but like the executor shouldn't be doing the research or decision making necessarily. That's what the researcher does, the planner, right? right? Yeah. So it, it seems like you shouldn't be needing to make a lot of decisions at that point in time. So as long as your prep work is good, I would think that that shouldn't be an issue. I don't know. What do you think, Banks? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, you know, if it, if it's coming into an area, I mean, I, I love the idea of alerts because um, mm -hmm. it, it really defines, you know, where your interest really should be. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess my, my only thought would be it, it does help to be kind of watching, but you can, you can do a one minute overview of where you're at in the day. I mean, if, if you're, you know, if, if you're getting into a situation where you want to be long from 15, 400 or something like that on NQ, but we're coming to that just absolutely nose diving into that um right you know that, that's a different scenario than we grind into that situation have some sort of setup and go um right you know but but i think but i think it, it, it at least gives you an opportunity to pay attention which which i think is what your main key is yeah, yeah. that's right that is a, that is the one thing though is that you don't have the whole context leading up to when your alert comes See, I, th I yeah, well, actually, uh, that appeals to me, Joel. I, I find myself staring at the screens way too much unproductively, like unable to focus on anything else, even when it's not in a spot I want to pay attention to. So being able to turn the screens off and then just, you know, work on business stuff until the alert goes off and be like, oh, okay, let's pull up the charts and see where we're at. Like, I love that thought, that idea. I love the way that that just sounds. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so like on your like on your setups, like I guess this would be my next question without getting into too much detail. So you have defined levels. Is is there something that you base a trade off of in that defined level? Yes. Is there a certain setup of the candles yep. or, or something along those lines? Yep. I have the levels that I use are from balance areas. And then I'm also now implementing gain loss levels. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Once it gets to one of those levels, then I use what I call a five minute Liz, which came from Purdue and yep. it is absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Purdue. Yes. Thank you, Purdue. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant and it's super easy. Either it goes or it doesn't. And um, yeah, without getting through the context of it, you can find it. Just go on to Bulls Discord, even just say hello, we'll find you. Um, and then the other <laughs> yeah. one that I have- I think I, I I think I explained it to you too, Banks, in my uh, in my evaluation form. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, uh, yeah. I'll. I'll. I'll definitely review that because you know I've I've heard you talk about that before. Um. So like you know like for instance like that same setup for me is I would want to see some sort of structure change. So, you know, if, if you're coming into an area where fifteen four is your area and we break it, you know, and, and I and I would say, I look more probably at liquidity than anything. Mm -hmm. where we're kind of taking either external or internal liquidity. And, and and basically what that is, is just taking highs and lows just to be, you know, I guess basic about it. Right. Um, but, but a setup off of there would be, you know, some sort of change of structure back in the opposite direction. Like, like if you're trying to get long and we're, and we're, you know, coming down into that pretty hard, I would want to see us change some structure, gain something, you know, which is, I, you know, I, I assume is, is, is what you're talking about. Gain something to where the buyers are proving something. Mm -hmm. For basic context, a list yeah, is the it. close, a candle close above the high of the candle that made the low. Okay. A close above the high of the candle that made the low. That's a Liz. So that would be okay. a change in direction, right? Yep. And then the other one that I use is a one minute gain. So essentially gain loss levels where you have to not only close above the swing high that made the low, but also you have to close above the next one in order to gain that one. 
Gotcha. So, so, and, and, th- and this is just a question just because I'm curious about it. So go ahead with the, li- uh, with the list set up, what time frame is that? Five minutes. So on that five minute, is it just a five minute close above that? Or are you looking for it to take out some sort of high on the next push? Uh, no, it's just a five minute close above that candle that made the low. And then you buy the top of the candle that made the low with your stop. Your stop just the below the... Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, and they work best on like when they set new swing highs or when they take out the old uh, liquidity spots, uh, like you'd mentioned, like previous swing highs or lows. Yeah, which in essence, I, I believe because it's probably in the opposite direction. So if we come into a high, we set that up, you're yeah. probably looking at a rebid or a reoffer, correct? It's, it's usually a mean reversion type trade, but it'd be a reoffer. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. And they work awesome if it's a sweep. If they sweep a low, mm-hmm. yeah, and then it sets up, they I would say it works significantly better. And on NQ, you can typically get those. And most often lately, I can get two trades out of one level. The first one I get on the initial low that sets up, and then I take off my core at two R. The rest will get stopped out at break even, and then within the next few candles, it sets up again. Except there's that sweep or that flush. Okay. And then it'll mm-hmm. set up again. And then oftentimes that one, I can hit T1 and T2, not always T3. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, w- I would love to sit down with both of you on that. Just to, and I, I could probably look in the Discord to find some more on it, but I, I'd be curious to see. Oh, if you want to hang, we can go through it. <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, because I'd be curious to see what, what kind of lines up on my stuff on why some trades would work and why and why some wouldn't. I would love that. Yeah, and I, I think that we could probably get it down to, you know, some sort of setup on like an A plus or you know, so because because a lot of the times where like and and I was talking to Bob about this, like, you know, there's there's times where we look at like single prints. Some people might call them fair value gaps or whatever you want to call them. But I, you know, in in, in just digging down deeper into it, like, you know, the those single prints are made to be filled. You know, in essence, like they're there because of the initiation off of that. And I think what me and Baba were looking at recently was the body that initiated that, which I think mm-hmm. would come in close to like what you guys are looking at, which is kind of mm-hmm. what we're looking at is in the sense of importance, because you can take it all the way to there and, and it not necessarily hurt the trend. You know, it's, I'd be pissed if you come all the way back to, you know, to it on a good trade, but it's, it's not going to hurt it until you take that high. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the old saying uh, you know, that wicks make the damage and the body tells a story. Um, you know, that, that is a, that is a true thing where, you know, if, Hmm. if, if you rely more on the bodies of those than necessarily like what the wick is, I think, I think it'll paint a better picture, which I think is what you're doing with the Liz. It's based on the body, not the wick, correct? Uh, It still has to close above the wicks. It still has to close above the wicks. Yeah. Yeah. So are your entries on the wicks or are they on the bodies? I usually scale mine in nowadays, um, but uh, like the way we were taught was all at the basically all as soon as it touches it, because there's a lot of times where it'll just touch it to the tick and take off. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. When those trades work, like you take like maybe quarter tick of heat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd be I'd be curious. Just I mean, we can do. Uh, I mean, shoot, we could just you, you know, shoot the shit with it. <laughs> I, I mean, it may be in it may be in Purdue's uh, in the EDU channel in our server actually the Purdue's write ups on them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll I'll definitely check that out because I I like to get a, a little bit more of a better understanding because because I've seen you guys post about it and obviously with you you know with you guys doing the evaluations I want to know you know what you guys are looking because because if that's a if that's a setup that you know you know back testing is a X percent win you know I I would go to the 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 length of if that's your edge just mm-hmm. trade that if you get three trades a week but you know that you're gonna have a high success rate and it's less stress on you. I mean, there, there's a couple of people that I know that trade, you know, a couple times a month, but at the same time, they, you know, they, they know when they take this setup that they got an, you know, 80%, 90% win rate on it, mm-hmm. you know, where it, it's, it's a high win rate, but you, you can size up and, and I'm not saying to do that, but, but, you know, for what they're doing, you know, they're, they're only taking a certain amount of setups per week or whatever, where, you know, they're going to go, I don't want to say all in, but they're, they're going to go heavy into a trade because they know what their win rate is. Well, it makes sense to focus on the flowers and quit watering the weeds. Yes, that's a great example. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Uh, that is a very good analogy. 
Yeah, I would love to uh, spend a little time. Like, I've done some back testing with it, but I that's the one thing that was in my evaluation is I need to get better at back testing. I can do it. I'm just not good at it. Yeah, maybe it'll come with practice, but just gotta keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think the back testing is hard because you know I would say like when I first started trading, most of most of the trading strategy came after days where I took my biggest beatings where you kind of get pissed and you kind of dig in a little bit. But at the same time, like that back testing has to go through different periods of the market. So like that same period of, you know, it might work for two weeks, but what happens when, you know, six months ago when it was just a different market. Yeah. And, and I think where the, you know, where like a lot of people struggle is they don't go back far enough or just, or like picking a random day is, is, you know, what I like to do. Like when I, like I'll just scroll back and all of a sudden I'm in, September of last year. Well, does it work? Because if it works, then it should work on any, you know, on any day, you know, potentially where, you know, you just kind of pick random days where you're not kind of aligning every single day, every single day, but like on gain loss stuff, you almost have to do it every day because of the fact that, you know, you're kind of going from day to day, day to day, level to level, you know, kind of thing. But if you're, if you're looking at some, like a Liz setup, you could pretty much go to any single day and you're probably going to have one print. Or, or multiple right. print to where you could test it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these ones print multiples. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it too, is that back testing, I think. And I'm, I've am i yet to meet anyone who... No, that's not true. Mike's coming up again <laughs> here. I've met one person that I know of who can back test like no one else. Um, doesn't seem like a lot of people do it, or they just do it quietly and don't talk about it. I'm not sure, but... Um, there's for sure an opportunity there for education. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Longtime fans of the show should be familiar with the lender formerly known as Sue Pullen, and I'm pleased to announce that she's back, fresh off a rebrand and ready to help as Sue Mackey. Sue is a certified mortgage advisor at Fairway Independent Mortgage, an equal housing lender who focuses on finding the right product for you and your needs. She has over 20 years of experience helping thousands of homeowners. Whether it's purchasing, refinancing, or even a reverse mortgage, Sue will help. Sue's licensed in 36 states now, so reach out and let Sue Mackey it happen for you. The best way to reach her is just give her a call at 520-977-7904 or in an email, spullen at fairwaymc.com. Fairway Independent Mortgage has an MLS number of 2289. Sue Mackey has an MLS number of 206048. That email again, S-P-U-L-L-E-N at fairwaymc.com. And that phone number is 520-977-7904. Shoot Sue an email and let her know she needs to update that address. Okay. Um, Now, what I think is kind of your bread and butter, if I'm not mistaken, is the smaller time frame execution. Like when Kyle and I execute, we're executing from a five minute chart and Oftentimes when I'm listening to you and Baba in the room or watching you guys, um, when my five minute Liz sets up, you guys are taking scales. You're already taking some right. off as my trades coming in, um, which tells me that either you're trading from a smaller time frame or you're executing before it actually sets up. So my guess is you're trading from a smaller time frame. Is there much that you can talk about with that? Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, I would say I, I look at a handful of of different time frames. Um, I kind of lean my bias, my plan off of the daily, four hour, hourly, um, and then I would say I probably execute more on the five minute, one minute is is the way I would normally set it up. But you know, like for instance, like your like like your less uh, you know Liz setup where you know I might be scaling out. Um, is, is just the fact of, you know, you know, on, on a smaller time frame or a bit, or even a bigger time frame where, you know, we were able to execute on the actual dip buy where there is a smaller change of structure, um, you know, on the one minute or, or, or even on the five minute where we come into a spot where it's, it's a rebid or a reoffer on a bigger time frame to where we, you know, I, I would say going back to the alerts is, is, is where we're kind of sitting up in our chair where, you know, where, you know, we may be executing 20 points lower or something along those lines. I don't see anything wrong with what you guys are currently doing. It's just a matter of, um, I would say the smaller time frame you have more opportunity 
but you also have more risk, which Mm -hmm. if, you know, if if you're trading from a, you know, five twelve tick or one minute or, you know, 30 second or, or, you know, whatever, you know, time frame that is, it, it just has to match what your comfort level is. You know, I would say more recently, I'm probably, I'm watching the one minute, but I'm, I'm executing more off of the five minute and even in, and I've even added the 15 minute um, just with the stuff that I've been working with Bob on um, where my execution still comes on the one minute, but it's in five or 15 minute areas of interest. Mm-hmm. I gotcha. So, and I, and, yeah. And, 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 you know, I would say whatever time frame you're on is kind of your expectancy of the trade. I mean, if you're, if you're on a four hour trade, you know, it's not going to happen in five minutes. You know, it's right. going to happen over the course of a day or uh, multiple days or, you know, multiple hours or something along those lines. If you're on a five minute setup, like, you know, that trade really for you to hit your, unless it's just a really initiative, it should be like it, at least five minutes. I would say even longer. I would say probably closer to 20 minutes to an hour, you know, depending yep. on what your take profits are and something along those lines. Right. Sounds about right. And so do you adjust your expectancy based on what chart you execute from? Like if you're choosing a a four hour level, would you expect your targets from four hour levels? Or do you, if it's a four hour level, but you're still executing from a one or five minute, do you look for a one or five minute target? Yeah. So on, on like an hourly or a four hour setup or something along those lines, I would say that if, if my bias or my plan is to be somewhat long, um, then, you know, I'll be long on smaller time frames where I'm taking out shorter term liquidity. Cause, cause I mean, you have to remember in, in our job, unless, unless you're carrying it overnight, which I don't really like to do, it's all, you know, intraday. So the way that I would normally trade is like, I'm trading to like, um, you know, certain spots on liquidity, you know, like for instance, if, if there's a, if there's a swing high, Um, and we come back and fail to take that swing high and I want to be short and I'm using that as kind of my structure. Well, then my target is going to be where we just went to as most recent internal swing low. So I'm using that as kind of my spot. So like there's times where, you know, you may look at my, you know, my R where it's a little bit skewed where, you know, I'm, I might take a trade where, you know, my first take profit might be three or four R of what my entry is, but it's really just based off of like, like what the actual trade and structure is. It doesn't necessarily mean that like, I, like, like I'm not going to take off a trade at two R just because it's two R. I got you. Now, if we get to two R and we, and we start to fade back to my position, I might be willing to take a break even, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to just take off a trade just because two R is my bracket. Like I, I'm going to let, I'm going to let the market dictate on, you know, where this position is going to be. And I bet you find that, a lot of times you end up getting a little bit more for those trades because of it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and and I would say in the past probably I I was probably more in and out of the market in the sense of like scalping wise. Uh but since I've kind of switched, which has been, you know, over the course of this year, I would say I'm more I'm more in tune to like the runner aspect of it. Like and 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 I think it, it I think it comes back to like the P&L driven aspect of it. Where, you know, like even, even me and Baba, we're working on stuff like that. That is one of my triggers is I hate seeing like a really good trade on P&L come back and take me out break even on a runner. Like even if it, you know, one micro or something like that, just because you're in a great situation, you're in a great trade where you could have easily taken it off for X. But, but the way that I'm viewing it now is like, like if, if I'm taking five contracts, I'm taking four of them, at least mentally as that's my trade where my fifth is almost there just as it's, it's like non-existent almost. Now it's hard to mm-hmm. see that on P and L and not, not say that, but at the same right. time, like you have to, you, you know, you have to almost, you know, like a day where you're going to drop, you know, like one of those NQ specials where you drop like 400 points. Like those are the day that those runners you get paid mm-hmm. like significantly paid where, where if, if we break certain structure, certain, you know, market, you know, structure to where like, you know, it could really go like that. That's what the runner is holding out for. You know, there's certain times where you cut it at a hundred points or put a stop or, you know, you'll move your stop to a hundred points or something along those lines, which, which we've, you know, talked about in the room, but that's kind of just on whatever your comfort level is. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I would say, you know, more of my positioning is probably, you know, if, if it's, if it's five contracts, you know, I'll take two of them off to pay for the trade where if I'm, you know, if I don't move my stop, then that's what it is. Or, or at a certain positioning to where like, you know, liquidity needs to be swept or that's where we're targeting, like to make this trade work. Because like, you know, for instance, if, if I'm shorting 400 and we need to take 380 to make this trade work, like I'm going to take my core off at 380 and then reevaluate if we break that and fall back into, you know, 380 to 400, like, like that needs to be reevaluated, but I definitely want to get paid for this trade. Now, if we can't come down and break 380, then my trade's probably non-existent anyway. Like, you know, for this trade to work is, is typically like the, where I would take my core off of. Hmm. I gotcha. I actually, I like that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I also like that you're still growing and like, I think you were more in and out, right? Before. Yeah. So I, I was probably more, I was, I traded bigger size, quicker take profits, mostly in and out where I wouldn't really take like runner situations. And I, I kind of changed that aspect of, I wanted, I wanted to get, you know, more of a, a runner you know, aspect, but I also didn't want to have the, the change in the P and L, you know, mindset, which, which I, you know, I, I think, you know, in my mind, like I like having a daily goal. Um, sometimes it can be a little detrimental because you kind of know what you make. Um, but that's where those runners are kind of like cherry on tops where, you know, if, you know, if you get into a situation where your trade is going to make you X amount of points, that runner, it really doesn't matter what it does then. Because it, you know, if, if your goal is 200, you know, if it's, you know, hundred dollars, $200 or whatever it is, if you get to 200, you know, $200 on your four contracts out of your five, well, then the last one really doesn't matter anyway. You hit your daily goal. Right. It's just a matter of what you can get with it. So, and I think it's all kind of mindset because, and, and I think it's who you're trading with. Cause like, like, you know, I've traded apex before you, you almost have to trade in and out where you can't mm-hmm. take a runner unless you're trading like a, like a, like a 300 K eval account or something along those lines. But, you know, I would say most of the time that you're in like one of those where the trail follows you, you almost have to be more in and out and almost have to trade bigger size, which is why they do it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, with the, with the evals that I've currently done, like outside of my cash accounts is I've actually went back to top step um, because they don't have the trail drawdown um, to where you can actually have runners um, and it, it doesn't affect you. So, and I think it's just a comfort level. It's like an end of the day type of thing. Yeah. So it's an end of the day. It doesn't trail intraday, which is, that's a big, that, that was a big step for me because I, I honestly, I hated apex for it. Like the trail drawdown. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's such a hard way to trade because, you know, you can take a day where you're up significant amount of money, which is where, like, I would say is, you know, if like, like on a big, like on a big trend day. So, you know, you have a runner come all the way back from like a hundred points. Well, you just blew up your account and you were still out right. money. So, yeah, right. That's ridiculous. <laughs> well, in my mind, it didn't make any sense of why they would, I, I get why they do that. They want people to pay for resets, but yeah, yeah. it's just, it's just not like the way that I trade now. It, it wasn't conducive with, with what I wanted to accomplish as a trader. Yeah. I think you either have to trade really big and really aggressive or super small that you creep and crawl forward. Right. Yeah. If you creep and crawl forward with apex, then you never, it never draws you down far enough that it can catch you. Or if it, by the time it does, um, you were probably hopeless at that point anyway, (laughs) for lack of a better way to put it, because like my account, I mean, (laughs) my, um, like if you're just bleeding, my, my stop for the day is at $150. Mm-hmm. And they call it a twenty five thousand dollar account, but I call it a fifteen hundred dollar Apex account. Yeah, at fifteen hundred dollars, my game is over, and so I yeah. use a hundred and fifty dollar daily drawdown, which means if I hit my daily drawdown ten days in a row, um, it it wasn't going to work. Like the eleventh day wasn't going to save me. Right. So um, I think that's and so I, in my mind, that's trading fairly small for what you would trade in a prop account. I trade for MNQ, and so I get usually up to three, two to three trades a day if they go against me. Um, mm-hmm. But oddly enough, I 
blew up a few and then I thought you know what I'm gonna try this scalping thing that I wanted to do and sure enough that's the account that got funded <laughs> but do you think do you think I can garner the courage to try and scalp three full NQs on a paid for funded account not even maybe <laughs> Like the risk is just astronomical. I get two trades, maybe a third, and the count's gone if I don't do it right. And then with the added pressure, um, I've chosen to go back to just trading smaller again. I think though, once I can build this account up, I'm going to try another one. And if I get it, then that one, I'm going to go for it. Yeah, I mean, so you know, in, in our line of you know work of you know, being a trader and, you know, you know, going down this road, there, there's really like two ways to do this. You know, there, there's a way where you can kind of go on these evals and just go all in and get it funded and then continue to do that. But, you know, when like when you're funded, I mean, you can easily make significant amount of money trading two to three micros, like significant mm -hmm. amount of money. It's just a matter yeah. of, you know, your your red days can't be astronomical compared to your green days. And I, and I think that's where something where I've noticed like over the past couple of years is something that I've, you know, definitely worked on is, and it was, it was something Bob, had, you know, it was, and I can't remember when he told me this, but you know, he, I mean, he asked me, which is something that we put on, you know, the eval was, you know, your red days are, you know, are they small or are they big? Cause you know, in the past I would say my, like normally I, there in my mind, there would be no such thing as a small red day because in, in the grand scheme of it, like you're trading these evals you know, it's either you want to make a significant amount of money or you're going to take that thing to max drawdown. And there was like no in-betweens of that. I think that's why they built them like that. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that it just stuck with me. Like, like where there's, you know, there's, you know, and I, and I don't know why it stuck with me, but in the same sense, of like, you know, losing three trades in a row, I'll cut it for the day. It, it, you know, that like, that's like, that's my rule. Kind of like the one that you were talking about. But like, you know, there was times where like it would be, you know, if I had 150 K account, like, you know, you would, you would go down three K on the account and that would be your day. Well, it's a lot harder to dig out of three K than it is 600. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. that, and then, and that's where I think a lot of people fall into trouble is where there's, there's not a thing like a red day where it's a small red day, kind of like, well, you know, what you're defining, like your defined risk is X and you know what your, you know, your profit goal is. So, you know, a bad day, you know, for instance, I, I, and I think it was 250 bucks, right. Of like your worst day. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you know, if it is 250 bucks, you know, the next day you can make that back or at least your right. profit goal of 150 bucks, where I think a lot of people fall into trouble is, you know, you know, their, you know, profit goal is 200 bucks, but they're willing to give 3000 for it. <laughs> you know and, and that's just, not wrong the math, the math the doesn't, math doesn't work no. and so i um i follow this guy on youtube it's called the day trader next door he's a guy from ontario and he's just a regular guy that trades and oftentimes and it finally clicked for me for whatever reason he says your max drawdown in your day you should be able to get back in one good trade right? So if your yeah. max loss for that day, you can get back in one good trade. So then that got me looking at my stuff. And I went, well, I track this. Like when I'm winning, my average win is anywhere from 120 to about $300 with the average being around 180. Mm -hmm. So if my regular day is a little more than 120 and an average day is 180, 150 is a reasonable drawdown because I, in one good trade, I can get that back. I like yeah. that. Yeah, I like it too. So I'm trying it and that's only in the last about a month um, because before that I was willing to risk 1500 for whatever I could get in those <laughs> emails, tips. right? And so, yeah. and so this, this time around, I'm trying to actually trade it like it matters. Um, for me, this Apex account is real money. Um, it's a real account because if I make money in it, I can get paid when it's an eval. It's super tricky because I can just buy another one for $14, but once you're actually funded, then it, yeah. it becomes real. Yeah. I don't have to do anything else before I can get paid. 
Yeah. And I, and I, and I think that's where a lot of people get into trouble too, is the switch between them because of the fact that where, you know, you've traded for an eval for so long where when you get to a PA, I'll, yeah, I mean like a lot of the companies, it's still SIM money, you know, in essence. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the way that they view it is it's still like the same account. Now, the way you view it in your mind is I went from play money to this could be real money. And I think that mindset of, of, you know, what you're taking is, you know, kind of putting defined rules on it. I love it because I think a lot of people get into that and they're still swinging it like it's an eval account and they're like, oh, well, I can just start over. Well, you know, when, you know, when you have those account blows where you're just buying another one, I think that's where a lot of people have issues because you get into a situation where you're, you're kind of allowing bad behavior to happen of something Mm -hmm. that you you know, I guess as a trader don't necessarily want, I mean, you, I mean, you don't want to blow an account, but you know, like you said, the evals are so easy just to buy another one. And you know, where you get into a situation where you blow an account and you get another one the same day where I know a lot of people do because apex has been making millions of dollars over the, you know, the course of this year where, you know, you get into a situation where, you know, you take your max drawdown for the day where you're trying to, you know, let's just say you're trying to long a trend day down well, eventually it's going to work. It's just a matter of when the bottom is. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you, know, <laughs> you watch me. <laughs> I can buy the dip all day on a trend day. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I, I think a lot of people fall into that same category where they, they have the issues and, and, and I think it's different because I think you, you know, you're more on top of like where your mental is, but I think where a lot of people fall into mistakes is it's, it's play money and it's not, there's no real defined rules. Like you have a defined setup, you have a defined risk reward, you have, you know, uh, you know, the mental, you know, capacity for, you know, switching for those. I would say a lot of people don't, but you know, what I would recommend is, you know, when you get, um, you know, to a, you know, a spot where you can take a withdrawal, just make sure to pay yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That's such a big thing in this industry. You put in all the time and effort, you might as well get something for it. Yeah, absolutely. Said. I can't wait for that day. I hope it's not far off. Okay, so um, if I get one more question, Mr. Banks, um, every now and again, I'll have a rogue blowout day. Um, those days are like $800 losses on a, on a risk where I'm supposed to be taking 150 with a max of 250 if I can pull things together for the last $100. Um, but at 250 it's got to be done for the day. Um, so I do have a thing where for whatever reason, which I have yet to discover, I can blow up an account. I can go completely rogue off the rails. Um, and I just don't respect a daily stop. I'm not one who will move a stop down in a trade. If it's going against me, I'll take the stop and I'll just get back in. Um, or I will flip directions. So I'm looking for some advice, I guess. What do you have for me if I wanted to work on that? Yeah, so I would say I would say kind of getting into your emotional aspect of it. Is, is there is there certain feelings that you feel when that occurs? Like is it noticeable? I th- I think so. Like I think there's um there's obviously frustration um and then it's I think it's a f- fear of loss, but I don't know that it's an actual fear. Um, I do often, more often now than I used to, I have this feeling of um, it's taking so long and I've gotten nothing for it. I've yet to take a withdrawal from a personal account or a PA account or anything. So for almost five years, I've been funding trading. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting starting to get tired. You know what I mean? Like I don't need yeah. to make enough for a Lambo. Funny for me, it's like relief. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that there's there's definitely emotions. There's definitely stuff that triggers, at least for me personally, that I've that I've noticed when those days occur. And it's such a hard thing, but like the I guess the thought of it and kind of, you know, kind of getting into one of those situations, like um, you know, there's, there's certain emotions that, or at least that I feel there's certain things that trigger me on those type of days where it's the hardest thing to do, but it's just walking away. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the mindset of, you know, you live, you know, to trade another day, which, you know, like on my, you know, my circumstances where, you know, I have a rule where it's, you know, three, 
I would say three losses in a day. Now they don't have to be consecutive. Um, but I would say it's, it's probably more where I, you know, I'm just, it's not one of those days where I'm going to be right, you know, where, and, and I don't know why there's just certain days where, you know, the cost of doing business is, is going to occur. And I would say those days trigger me the most where, you know, I start to get that feeling like I can't trade or like, this is never going to go it like, you know, in my, you know, way kind of feel where, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're the, yeah. I would say emotions are a big thing. I would say, you know, where, you know, there's trades that like I'm trading outside of my plan um, or I'm trading against like what my pre-plan was is a big thing or something to where it's, you know, where like I have a defined plan and I have it set in motion and I watch it all day long and I kind of, and, 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 I, and I think this is a big thing too, which, which I kind of review the day as I'm trading it. So like, like, you know, when I'm not in a situation, like I'll go back and look at a trade and if it's just something that is just completely out of what my bias was or what my plan was, it's it's just something to keep an eye on because I know that I can get a little bit frustrated when like a trade doesn't go the way I want it to go. And and you know like even with Baba, like I mean th- there's days where like you know he'll call me in the middle of trade and be like, "Dude, what was I thinking?" And I and I think you gotta have someone. You know, I mean, like in all honesty, like you have to have someone that you're just straight up honest with. Um, because there, there's going to be days where you look back and review it, where you're thinking, what was I looking at today? Like it was completely against my plan. It was completely against trend. I was just buying every single dip outside of my plan, you know, completely rogue off of, of, you know, what I would normally do now. I mean, there, there's going to be days where you have red days. There's going to be days where, you know, you have the cost of doing business. Like that's, that's just, you know, what reality is. You can't be perfect in this game. Um, and, and, but I think, I think to your question, I think, you know, the, the emotional aspect to it is, you know, what, what kind of triggers you because at the same time, like what triggers you in trading is probably what triggers you in life. So like, for instance, you know, if you're not a very patient person, (laughs) <laughs> you're probably, you know, you're, you're probably not getting into trades on the exact level that you want to, cause you're not waiting for it to set up. Well, when you don't let it to set up and it hits your stop, then all of a sudden it gets back into the, like, like I'm pissed about this trade. Like it, you know, it didn't set up or, or you get into those situations where it comes, take your stops and all of a sudden it goes Wait, But, but I yeah. think, you know, just, just kind of understanding. And I think that's kind of what the eval, like what we're trying to accomplish is, you know, I, I think for you to become a successful trader, and I'm just saying you just in general, I think you yeah. almost have to know yourself a little bit better as a person, because oh, if, yeah. if, you know, if you know that, you know, you're an impatient person, that's the first thing that I'd focus on because, you know, what's going to happen is you get into a situation where you're trying to get into a trade at X price and all of a sudden you're in it for 10 points lower than what you you know wanted to be in just to be in the trade because you didn't want to miss it. And all of a sudden we go to your entry point. Well, that's your stop now. So, you know, there, there's, there's times where you just need to be like more present of, of what you feel like in the moment a little bit. And, and there's times where you're going to get into trades where, you know, it doesn't feel right. Or like the trades not moving in your direction the way that you want it to. Like those are trades that I would just cut because in all honesty, if you get into a trade and you expect it to do one thing and it kind of just sits there or kind of goes against you you know, a little bit and kind of pops back to your entry. Like those are the trades, at least my opinion, where I'm not comfortable in holding because it's something to where I wasn't, um, it wasn't expected of me. So like, you know, for instance, if I want to get into a trade and I expect this to move quickly and it doesn't move quickly, then what's the point of being in that trade? It kind of goes against everything that I wanted it to be. So now I might miss that trade and I might be pissed about it, but at least, at least psychologically I was right. You know, because the vast majority of times that's going to hit my stop. So, I, you know, you know, there's no real easy way to say that. I would say, you know, the vast majority of people struggle with the psychological piece of trading. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of people don't understand that trading is exactly like who you are in your life. I, it, it's not exactly the same, but like if you have issues in, in, in your life or like you're coming into a day where you're not fully focused or you're, you know, sick or something along those lines where it's not going to give you hundred percent of your time. Like you're going to fail that day. And I mean, there were, there was a handful of days in September that I just didn't trade. 
because it, mm-hmm. it wasn't in a setup. It wasn't into an A plus setup where I didn't feel comfortable putting on risk to just be in a trade, you know, where, where like a lot of the times where it, like, at least in the past, like I would be putting on risk in a B, B setup to where, yeah, it's probably going to work, but I'm not positive on it and I don't feel comfortable doing it. So, I mean, the, I mean, there, there was a handful of days where we were live on mic where I just didn't take a trade. Like I talked about certain setups and I told people like, I I'm flat on the day. I'm not taking this, but like, this is an opportunity where, you know, it just, it, it wasn't something that, and I don't know if it was psychological, maybe, you know, maybe subconsciously something was going on, but it it just wasn't something that, um, was into my setup where I just didn't want to take it. And, and I think getting into those situations where you kind of know yourself, at least the way you feel getting into a setup is such a strong thing because without knowing that, you know, all of a sudden you get a little anxious about a trade. Well, has that ever happened before? You know, you start to see the PL move and you start to see it in, you know, in your benefit and you start getting a little happy to the trigger a little bit. You know, does, does that happen quite often? And, and, and those are the type of questions that I would just ask myself and, you know, where, you know, it's not going to be the same for everyone, but if those things are trigger points to you, you know, those are going to be what causes the large days where, you know, either, you know, something along the line or, you know, even something as small as like, you know, why did the market, you know, not do what I wanted it to do? Well, cause it's the freaking market. <laughs> like it's going to do whatever the hell <laughs> Like, you know, just, you know, just because you got into a trade doesn't mean it's going to work. Like that's the cost of doing business. But if you kind of look into that and saying like, you know, this is a, like, this is a trade where it needs to bounce from here and it falls below that. And we fall another 200 points and you're buying everything below that. Well, that that's where the starting point happened. Like you had it in your plan where below this is not a great place to be dip buying until X, but you're, but you bought it the whole way down. Well, it, it's because you had it in your mind where we need to hold before, you know, this level and you're buying to get back above this level or something along those lines. Like it, you know, yeah. it's, it's just a trigger. Yeah, that. that's, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. I have an idea for you, Joel. Ooh, what is it? Uh, the emotions that you felt after blowing up, are those better or worse than the emotions you feel in the moment when right before you start to take the next trade after hitting a max drawdown? That's a great question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Are the emotions that I feel from blowing up? Do you feel better? worse right before you uh, start pulling the triggers and blowing up? Or do you feel worse after the account is dead and you've killed it? No, I feel worse after I've killed it. I think you and I are opposite in that way. I think we are. I would suggest writing down all the emotions you feel after you've blown an account. Put it on a sticker note and then stick that somewhere where you can see it. Just something to help you break that cycle. When you're starting to feel distressed and you can look and be like, oh, shit, uh, that's way worse. I don't want to feel that. Let's just stop here and deal with this. Yeah. I'm, well, and, and you know, to that same thing, I mean, I would I would even go down the same route of which which I hope it doesn't happen that you blow an account, Joel. But, you know, I, I would say start off with <laughs> your next red day, like, you know, the feeling of yeah. like, what your next red day is, because your next red day you know, the day after that is typically where people have issues, too, because you want to get that red day back which it's, you know, at that point, you're kind of trading a little bit of P&L and you're not trading what your process is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, for me, that does happen for sure. Happens to all of us. I've gotten a lot better at red days. I've gotten a lot better at red days. And that was something that I even said, was it last month that I wanted to work on? Um, Mm -hmm. I was going to practice losing, essentially. Yeah. As hard as it is to do. Um, But I was actually thinking about doing the same thing. Oh, open an account and just take, try to take losing trades for that yeah. whole apex account and just see how it feels. Yeah, see how this... hard it is to take losing trades when you do it on purpose. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a funny thing is when you do that and you, you actually pass one of those accounts on like the first day. Uh, huh. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I take it. I'll call it my new system. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> All right, Joel, uh, you got anything I'd else you want to say before we, yeah, before we wrap this up? Yeah. I would like to express uh, sincere gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Banks, for your time. Absolutely. Anytime. Much appreciated. Anytime, for real. Uh, I'd echo that sentiment. I love doing these. I, yeah, I love doing these type of, you know, talks. And, 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 and I think that's what we do, like, you know, at least in, in Vanta's. I love the, the late night conversations because that's how 
I got better at trading. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, these, these type of events where you can kind of get on with two people that are doing it at the same time as you and kind of talk through process and talk through, you know, talk through the, you know, the mental side of it, I think is a huge, huge thing, you know, in this game. I love that. Well said, Mr. Banks. And I think we also got to say thanks to Joel for setting this whole thing up. Uh, he reached out, he put the Absolutely. questions together. He, he did all, all of it except for hitting the button here. So thank you, Joel, for setting this up. Awesome. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time. That's going to be it. But that's no reason to be sad because you can get your asses over to Vanta Trading or Vanta, depending on uh, which uh, which side of the Mason-Dixon line you're on. <laughs> All those links will be in the episode <laughs> description. We will be back soon with another exciting episode. But until then, what should they do, Joel? Smash that like button like a pumpkin on November 1st. <laughs> Ooh, you fan of the pumpkin chunkin festival? Oh, that's a real thing, isn't it? Don't you smash pumpkins after Halloween? Oh, we've got uh, whole competitions where they try to launch them into the air with catapults and mortars and shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we don't do that. We just we just drive yeah, over them and stuff. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Two Bulls in a China Shop is an entertainment program, and all thoughts and opinions expressed in the show belong to the hosts and not of any company. They are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide entertainment about stocks and the financial industry of trading. If you make trades based on what you hear in this show, you assume all risks for those trades.